And here's a little bit of the story behind Amazing Grace. How many of you know the story behind Amazing Grace? Okay, a couple of you do. I'll wake you up when we're ready to say it. As week after week, a mother faithfully did her part to teach her impatient son about Jesus. She required him to memorize Bible verses and songs. She, he showed no real interest. Finally, at the age of 11, he got his break and he moved out to see the world and make his fortune by sailing the seas. Those thoughts now seem like an eternity ago as this weary, exhausted sailor attempted to steer his wounded ship through a raging storm. He was too exhausted to help pump seawater with the mechanical pumps below deck. So his crew tied him up top to the helm and left him there to do what he could in the raging storm. The ship's canvas sails were tattered and ripped. The wooden sides of the ship were torn away and splintered. The once impressive ship that had been thrashing about in the North Atlantic storm for a 11 days. Yeah. The crew had little hope of survival if the storm didn't end soon. John, secured by the ropes, held the wheel as steady as he could for 11 hours that day, starting at 1 o'clock in the afternoons. A clear testament to his physical abilities, but inside, he pondered on how his life was weak, ruined, and in grave despair, just like the battered ship that he tried to steer. John used to be proud of his reputation as the great blasphemer, but not these days. At one point he sang so low that he was a servant to slaves. He was a failure. He was at the bottom. As he pondered on his sad state of affairs, he reflected on his mother and how she would pray he would become a minister of all things. Sometime that afternoon into the evening, he remembered some of those childhood memory verses like Proverbs, because I have called and ye refused, ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also laughed at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distrust and anguish come upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Now how's that for a little kid memorizing that verse, huh? That's pretty impressive. But that's what came back to his mind. They seemed to confirm he deserved every bit of his current conditions. He had rejected the truth of God's word. Even worse, he had led other sailors into unbelief. Certainly, he was beyond hope and had no value to anyone. Yet, more memory verses from his youth kept coming to him. They reminded him of Jesus, of the promise of salvation, of hope and of deliverance. And as the storm ground on that evening, despite all that John had done that was contrary and evil, he asked God for his gift of salvation. And on that day, March 21st, 1748, John asked, and God answered, John Newton's request to save his soul. Many years later, as an old man, Newton wrote in his diary, only God's amazing grace could and would take a rude, profane, slave-trading sailor and transform him into a child of God. Eventually, Newton left slave trading and took a job as a tide surveyor. He wasn't content with that either. He began to think he had been called to the ministry. And finally, in 1764, at the age of 39, his mother's prayers were answered. John Newton began a 43-year journey of preaching the gospel of Christ. What does all this have to do with this hymn? For the Sunday evening services, Newton would often compose a hymn which would develop the evening's message. And by 1779, he had 280 of these hymns, and they were combined into the only hymns hymnal. It was named after the little town they lived in. And the most famous of the only hymns was Faith's Review and Expectation. It grew out of David's exclamation in 1 Chronicles. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house, that you have brought me thus far? And this was a small thing in your eyes, O God. You have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come, and have shown me future generations, O Lord God. Now we know that hymn, Faith's Review and Expectation, as Amazing Grace. So let's sing, I think there's, 
Five verses. Let's sing five verses.
This is the last of the original members of Rose and Grace, and then uh, Ted Whistler and some other fellows started the quartet back in 1932. Ted's our elder statesman, but not quite that old. But Ted, Ted's finishing his 24th year with Rose and Grace in 1994 is when he started. And I'm the last guy in, and Dave Miller singing the bass part since 2007. We're just glad to be with you tonight. We sing a style uh, called Southern Gospel Music. I, I know some of you like Southern Gospel style singing, and um, you know, some, those kind of songs have a unique uh, style to them, don't they? There's a lot of ins and outs of parts, and maybe they'll bring in parts of scripture or another song. Uh, sometimes it's an old, old style a piano part that leads in or, or fills in during the, the piece. And well, that's what you learn about a little bit of southern style singing on this song, the old convention song.
Oh, and I love those songs because of the bass part. When no, you get that jump over and slide here and come in, come in, come in when you want and let out. Tell me the bass. Why are my song passing microphones out there? So if the bass singers don't want to come up and sing this style, be my guest. Uh, we're going to put a song in here that we were really thinking of, of doing because, uh, well, we didn't know we had a half an hour. Right? We, we were 20, 25 minutes. We're going to, we're going to put it in this song because it's a hymn that you're all going to know. And it's really associated with the Easter time, but it doesn't need to be limited to that. We don't want to relegate it to, to that slot of time because it's just so beautiful. It's one that you're going to know uh, by heart. You're certainly welcome to sing along if you want. Don't use your mics, though. I'm not going to say that. But you're going to know the song in the garden. I come to the garden alone.
he saw me again. You know, Bible stories, uh, like I said, keep us going in some rough times or a good teaching tool to uh, the younger generation. And this, this one is an illustration that would come from the New Testament times. It seems there were, there were four guys standing around. No, no, not four. We're not that old. But uh, they weren't agreeing on something. See, there was a sick fellow down here, and uh, they couldn't decide what, the, what was the best course of action because a number of them doubted that anything could happen to this fellow anymore. He was beyond, beyond hope. One of the four fellows then stepped up and said, I'm not so sure about that. There's a real aha moment in this song. See if you can listen to it.
I'm not sure of that. We're here to help. We can't get you there, but we can point you in the way. This is Mike Swain tell you a story about Good Morning. Yes, salvation is a gift. And the price of that gift has been paid for you. But, like any gift, if you're not going to benefit from it, you have to accept the good. Here's a song by a man that accepts the gift. Yes, it's a good day. I lay down my head. I slept real good and I rose from my bed. Preached. 
and John received a draft notice in the fall of 1942. He entered the Air Force, and by 1944 he was a pilot of a Curtis C-46 commando and was stationed in the Burmese jungle. They flew supplies over the China Hump, a nickname for the Tulane Mountains. He had a number of close calls, but God guided him through many perils and brought him safely home. After the war, the GI Bill allowed John to attend Moody Bible Institute. When that would happen today. <laughs> so, to pursue gospel song writing as a career, he eventually moved his family to Montrose, Pennsylvania, and became a music editor for a Sixpiration Publishing uh, Company. And he branched out to write both choral music and cantatas. And all John Peterson wrote over a thousand songs and dozens of cantatas. Popular songs included Took a Miracle, Springs of Living Water, No One Understands Like Jesus, Over the Sunset Mountain, and this one. Oh, it's wonderful to meet a Christian. So we've got uh, three verses of this. So everybody stand up so you can get that blood flowing again. And we'll sing through this one. Grab those microphones if you got them and sing along. Sun crept through the curtain windows, and I sat down at the piano 
my hands began to browse over the keys. Well, his fingers found a familiar melody, and the words to precious Lord, take my hand, began to well up from his heart and to spill out of his mouth. God had given him a song that would not only lift him from despair, but would also change the course of his career. Dorsey remembered an old melody from his Sunday school days in the United Methodist hymn, Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone? by George Allen, and then he added his own words. Precious Lord became the most famous of his many gospel songs. He gave the song to Fry, who introduced it to the choir at the Atlantis Ebenezer Baptist Church the next Sunday. An event that Dorsey later remarked tore up the church. Martin Luther King Jr., or Martin Luther King Sr., was the pastor of Ebenezer at this time. And beginning his ministry there in the year before 1931. So we have three verses to precious Lord King. Flavorful, flavorful ones there. 
Ira wrote this song in 1915, just two years after his wife divorced him. Whatever the case may be for his wife, Zelma's leaving, it put Ira in a great state of depression and grief. Ponder on this vivid imagery as we sing this song. It has now been all but lost in our culture. No longer do kids play out of sight. No longer does the call come for summertime. Bounce across the fields and through the backwoods. But for a few short minutes, let's go back in time and reminisce together. As we sing the first two verses, okay? then we're going to try and throw an instrumental in here. <laughs> Woo! We're going to try. Okay? And when you guys are playing the instrumental, that's you guys. Okay, then I'm going to try and read the words that Ira would read when they played an instrument. Yes. We could really mess it up, but that's okay. Okay? And uh, this is the Ira's spoken message, just like he used to do when they would sing this song. And then we'll sing the third verse together. So, Tim, there's no like, extra word in there, I guess so. All right. So, and then uh, if, if you need a practice time through at the beginning, give them a long introduction so they can get Because <laughs> ah, the history books here, they anyway, uh, no one knows this one, right? Yes. 
uh, or three generations below Ted. <laughs> but then you ever look around and say, wow, how did I get to this stage in life? I got here pretty quick, didn't it? I used to think people that went to their 50th class reunion were old, but not anymore. No, thank you. <laughs> You look around and say, wow, how fortunate we've been, those of us who have made it this far, because I know you, like we can list many people who weren't that fortunate, right? But life has been a series, I would say, of blessings and bruises, highs and lows, peaks and valleys. And uh, it's amazing that we got this far in one day sometimes. But you know, if you're walking with the Lord, it shouldn't be a surprise, because He can carry you through some of those darkest times and help you enjoy and celebrate some of those high points in life. All in all, I know that the Lord has been with me as the sun has shone down on me.
She lived, lived nearly 100 years and was blind shortly after her birth. So what a remarkable, what a remarkable gift the Lord had given her. Now you know her mostly for songs like Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. To God be the glory. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. I am thine, O Lord, and what? 8,995 more. We're going to do one now. You should know this one, but you might know it under a different title. You might know it as I Shall Know Him. Uh-uh. Not the name. I don't know what's in the hymn book here, but I hope it's in your hymn book because a lot of churches we go to don't have this particular Sympathetic Crosby hymn. It is known as My Savior First of All. So if you're an educated hymn crowd, I hope you know this Fanny Crosby song.
this one and then one to follow and we'll, we'll be on our way. We'll call it another wonderful evening with you folks. And I, there are cookies there, right? There are cookies. So cookies, in the, cookies in the library? Is that are, are there cookies? Is that what I remember? Yes, there are. <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> well, anyway, this song, uh, boy, this would be a great sermon. What do I have, another 20 minutes or so? Not according to my head, no. This is a song that, uh, it's really, it's about the, the thieves in the Easter story. You know, the three thieves? And you say, well, we two thieves hanging out alongside of our Lord. Yeah, but how about Barabbas early in the week, the first of the three thieves in the Easter story? He was excused from his earthly crimes and sins, wasn't he? As was custom in that day. So he more or less dodged the bullet, right? He walked away from uh, what was facing him as punishment. He received mercy. He didn't get what he deserved. So then we go to the thieves on the cross, and we Look to uh, the left of the Lord, and there's a thief hanging that uh, was hardened in his heart. And uh, he received justice for his crimes in this life. Got his reward, or not a reward. <laughs> he received eternal punishment for what he did. Now, we like to talk about the thief on the right. Really just as bad as these other two thieves, but he was different. How was that? Well, he recognized who he was hanging aside of, didn't he? And he said, Lord, when you get to heaven, please remember me. Or could have said, well, you're no better than this other fellow over here. You'd receive, you need justice in your life. What did the Lord say to him? Today thou will be with me in paradise. Not just give me goosebumps every time I talk about this song and that, that situation. And he received what? Grace. Something far and above what he really deserved. So the question really for you is, which of those thieves do you relate to? Kind of mercy, you're not quite sure, you're dodging the bullet, you'll make your decision later. Is your heart hardened? And you've turned away from the Lord, never to be saved and brought back? Or are you like that thief that realized at his dying moment who he was hanging aside of and could save him for all eternity? The issue we have is we don't, we're not guaranteed at that 11th hour like that thief on the cross. So if, you, if, if you're hearing what we're talking about and singing about tonight and don't know the Lord that we're talking about, see one of us. See Mike. See one of the, the people here uh, that, that you know are living a Christian life. And we'll help you get can you imagine that the, uh, the story that that thief had to tell when he crossed over into heaven that very day? What a story he had to tell somewhere in glory. Day.
Yeah. 